Hi. I want to continue now with our study of Book 1 of Plato's Republic. Last time uh, we looked at the character uh, Paul Marcus. This time I want to look at the character Cephalus. So you'll recall the dialogue began with uh, Paul Marcus stopping Socrates and Glaucon when they were returning home from the Piraeus. And he said, oh, I want you to come back to my house. And so that's basically the next scene is they're at his house. And so uh, let's read that. He says, then we went to Paul Marcus's home. And there we found Lysias and Euthydemus, Paul Marcus's brothers. And in addition, Thrasymachus the Chalcedonian and Carmantides the Paeanian and Clytophon the son of Aristonymus. So they go to Paul Marcus's house and there's a bunch of people there. Two of them are his brothers, Lysias and Euthydemus, but there are also a number of people uh, who are visiting. One of them uh, from out of town, Thrasymachus, who we'll, we'll go on to meet shortly. Anyway, then he says, Cephalus, Paul Marcus's father, was also at home. And he seemed very old to me. He was seated on a sort of cushioned stool and was crowned with a wreath, for he had just performed a sacrifice in the courtyard. So I just wanted to start with that little opening scene, because it's the scene of a home. It's Paul Marx's home. It's a house. It's a private house. And a number of things, our attention is brought to a number of things there. First of all, uh, that he, it's a family. Paul Marcus has brothers and a father. I mean, there may be women, too. We don't see them. But, you know, initially you're introduced to the single character, Paul Marcus, and now you see you know, he's got a whole family. And we actually already saw a version of that because when Paul Marcus came to get Socrates and Glaucon, he was with Adamantus, who's Glaucon's brother. So the theme of the family has actually already been raised for us in these characters. But anyway, so you see these, these people. You see the home where there are other people, some of whom are guests, like Thrasymachus from Chalcedon. Uh, which is to say Istanbul, uh, and uh, then we meet Cephalus, his father, and Socrates says he's old, so we're going to talk about that in a moment, but then he describes him, he says he's sitting on a stool, and he had a, he uh, was crowned with a wreath because he had just performed a sacrifice, and I just wanted to note that detail, because, you know, at a basic level, performing a sacrifice is a religious activity, and it's a normal religious activity in the homes of these people to perform sacrifices regularly to uh, remember and honor the family ancestors. Uh, so Cephalus is doing a normal thing. But notice the contrast between that and where this whole thing began. Right, It began with Socrates and uh, Glaucon at a religious festival, which seems to be a festival celebrating the introduction of the worship of the Thracian goddess Bendis in Athens. And that's one of the things that's relevant to dating it. It, it, it's uncertain exactly what the date of this dialogue is because it, we don't know about some of the details, but there's a pretty good chance it's uh, the dramatic date, like when this is supposedly taking place, is around 421 BC. There, there are competing interpretations, so that's not, not the only possible answer, but that's the one that I think is most likely. Uh, and that's one of the times when, it, one of the dates when it seems possible that the introduction of Bendis would have happened. Uh, anyway, there, they were at this big public religious festival. And now you come into Cephalus's house, and that again begins with a religious practice. So the first thing then that I want you to notice is, you know, I've been, I've been emphasizing how the Republic starts. It starts with this verb catabane and so on. In terms of content, how does it start? Well, it starts with religion. Right? The, the, the opening scene begins with a religious festival. That's the context for the human action we're going to witness. And then you go to the house for the next scene, and it starts with a religious thing that has just happened. And that, again, is the context for the home life. So the theme of religion is going to come up. Um, it's going to come up almost right away in some remarks Cephalus makes. And it's going to come up throughout the Republic. But it always comes up in a kind of a, for lack of a better word, backhanded way. Like, there's no point where people sit down and really address what religion is. But it's a thing you should be thinking about. And I, I think that there's an awful lot to learn about both good and bad ways to think about religion from this book. Uh, again, I, I mentioned Plato's Apology because there, Socrates does a pretty um, interesting and compelling job of presenting how he relates to religion. It would be very good to hold that in mind as a kind of comparison to what gets said here. Anyway, here then you have uh, Cephalus performing a family religious practice in the house, and, and that's just been preceded 
by this huge public religious festival that anybody can participate in. So the, the reason I'm in interested in this introduction is because it does portray something about the house, that there are guests there, that there's family there, and that there are sort of private religion there. So I'd like you to, to be thinking about that as you read this, this whole book. What happens in family homes? And indeed, what is the nature of the family? Because as you will see, that's going to become a pretty prominent issue later. Later, Socrates and, and Glaucon and the Adamantus are going to be talking about that and debating about it. But before you get into the theoretical arguments about it that those people have, you should yourself be thinking about what the reality of the family actually is. And to a significant degree, that's being put on display here. This is also a family in uh, Athens in the 5th century BC. And that's different both from your experiences of family life in, you know, for me, uh, 21st century Canada. Uh, and even in Greece, that experience of the family in 5th century BC Athens is different from the Greek experience of the family, let's say, one, two, five hundred years before. Because part of the political and social transformations in Greece at that time had to do with uh, transforming the way the status of the family was understood in society, especially the family of aristocratic people. But that's how we were to understand those things was was changing. Uh, because prior to uh, the rise of the Greek city-states starting in, let's say, roughly 800 BC, um, and uh, especially the emergence within those cities of democratic polities, uh, such as developed at Athens, prior to that, aristocratic families, you know, were more or less kings, and they remained a kind of noble class within these Greek cities, contending for political power against the, you know, democratic polity. So uh, um, the status of aristocrats and aristocratic families uh, was a charged political issue in Athens. So partially then, the portrayal of the family and what its uh, structures and implications are is is sort of, I think, intentionally being put on display here so that you can think about it, because it is going to be a subject of considerable discussion later in the book. Uh, but yeah, so uh, you get the uh, fact of guests and who those guests are. You get the fact of family members. You get the fact of private religious celebrations honoring you know family ancestors and so on and of course just remember this all takes place within you know a house so you know these people go into their kind of private domain and various things happen there and as you'll see in a minute you know that's also the domain where private wealth is accumulated and inherited and so on so so think about try to think about what the family home is as a social and political reality and think about that sort of as it's portrayed here. And indeed, this whole first book, well, I guess for that matter, the whole of the Republic uh, is a portrayal of something that happens in a family home. Socrates, you know, more famously goes out into the Agora, the marketplace, to talk with people. And he also then conducts his conversations in public, generally, uh, kind of like the Festival of Bendis. This is a private one. This is something taking place in a private home. Uh, Anyway, so uh, let's let's then carry on with uh, what he then what then happens with Cephalus. He's just said uh, Cephalus seemed very old to me, and so Socrates says at three twenty eight DDE, I am delighted to uh, discuss with the very old, uh, since they are like men who have proceeded on a certain road, that perhaps we too will have to take. For that reason, one ought, in my opinion, to learn from them what sort of road it is, whether it is rough and hard or easy and smooth. From you in particular, I should like to learn how it looks to you. Uh, so I find that quite an interesting remark, right? So the thing is about all of us, here's part of what it is to be an aging person. Uh, like that is to say, a person who ages, as we all are. We, in a way, know that we're going to get older, but we don't really know what it's going to be like. And certainly you got to get there to find out what it's like. But you see that other people are older and so you know you can rightly imagine oh that person is older than i am but that you person used to be a, a younger person like me and so uh 
they went from roughly here to there, maybe that person can show me something of what it's like. Uh, I emphasize the maybe there, though, uh, because I'm, I'm sort of repeating Socrates' remark. He says, they are like men who have proceeded on a certain path that perhaps we too will have to take. You know, there's no, there's no guarantee that the, that the path, the, the hadas, that that person is taking is going to be exactly the same as yours. Right? And so people provide a kind of um, sort of an ambivalent model for us. They show us what old age could be like, but they don't show us automatically what it's going to be like for us. Anyway, but so that's how Socrates introduces that. Uh, and so then from Cephalus, we get quite a few remarks about what old age actually is like from him. So he has said in the, in the uh, uh, remarks immediately before that one of Socrates, this is at uh, 328C to D, he said, uh, Socrates, you don't come down to the Piraeus, but uh, if I still had the strength to make the trip to town, to go up from the port of Piraeus, up a couple of miles into the city of Athens, uh, there would be no need for you to come here. I would come to you. But as it is, you must come here. Uh, I mean, so one of the points then that he makes is that, you know, he can't walk as well as he used to. His, his body is weaker, and that affects, you know, his mobility, um, both in the immediate sense that it's harder to walk, but in the larger sense that places that used to be accessible are now mm, kind of out of reach. And then he says further, uh, I want you to know that as the other pleasures, those connected with the body, wither away in me, the desires and pleasures that have to do with speeches grow the more. So again, he's telling you what his experience is, is like. So he then, notice, is making a distinction between different kinds of, well, he's having different kinds of experiences and he's sort of defining them. And some have to do with the body, some have to do with logos, speech. Uh, we're going to talk more about that word logos. Um, uh, then let's carry on with a little bit more about what he says about that difference. Uh, he says, I'll tell you how old age looks to me, Socrates. He said, some of us who are about the same age often meet together uh, and most of the members of our group lament, longing for the pleasures of youth and reminiscing about sex, about drinking bouts and feasts and all that goes with things of that sort. They take it hard that they were deprived of something very important. Um, so he says, you know, one of the experiences of old age is that you, something goes away. And he's saying about his friends, the same thing he said about themselves. He referred to the, uh, pleasures connected with the body as withering. And he says about them, they lament losing the pleasures of youth. So now he says connected with youth before he said connected with the body. Maybe there's something to work out there. Uh, and he names them, sex, drinking bouts, and feasts or festivals, and so on. So the things he's calling pleasures associated with the body are sex, intoxication, partying, basically. Um, so we, we ourselves, we ourselves can reflect philosophically on those things and see, you know, if his quick remark is satisfactory. Is it right to describe those as things connected with the body and to distinguish them from logos and so on? We can, we can think about that. But let's just see what they are. Like, that's part of what he says aging is about. And so he says, you know, my friends, the other old guys, uh, they're, they're really unhappy about that. And so for them, old age is hard to bear. But he says, so if, if that were the cause, I too would have suffered these same things insofar as they depend on old age. And so would everyone else who has come to this point in life. But as it is, I've encountered others for whom it's not so, especially Sophocles. Uh, and he basically says that about himself as well, right? That... Uh, him, he and Sophocles haven't experienced this transformation as a as a burden the way others have. And he, he quotes Sophocles. Sophocles says he joyfully did escape the desire to have sex with with a woman because he says it's as though I had run away from a sort of frenzied and savage master. And so he says, uh, describing his experience in line with what Sophocles said. Old age brings peace and freedom from these things. It, it says, with, with old age, it's, you're able to be free of very many mad masters. So, uh, again, then he's describing a change, the appearance of these desires, and then he's telling you something, then he's, he's having a bit of a theory about them. He associates them with the body, he associates them with youth, and he, 
he experiences them as mad masters, or he used to experience them as kind of mad masters controlling him, like he was sort of a puppet to those desires. And so he actually finds old age to bring him peace and freedom from them, and he's saying he likes that. Uh, and so that's why he then has said, basically, not everyone experiences old age the same way. But then Kephlis gives his reason why. He says, there is one cause of this uh, change uh, and how you deal with old age, how you feel about it. And he says, old age isn't the cause, Socrates, uh, for whether you're happy or unhappy. Uh, rather, the cause is the character of the human beings. If people are orderly and content with themselves, even old age is only moderately troublesome. But if they are not, then both age, Socrates, and youth alike turn out to be hard for that sort of person. Uh, he says character, uh, that translates as character, I mean, he really just says the, the kind of person you are. There are more technical words for character. Uh, but, but, but the point is right, right? It's like, what, what kind of person you are is really, he says, what's going to determine this. So it's interesting that he's saying the, the sort of biological transformations that amount to aging are not what define who you are as a person. Right? You also have a character, and that's essential to who you are, and it's a, it, it is essential to how you deal with the things you encounter. And so the, the physiological, biological process you go through isn't so much the unambiguous cause of what your life was like as it is that transformation within your situation about which you will have an attitude and and with respect to which you will develop a way of behaving and conducting yourself and so on uh, so that's Kephlis's then presentation of the sort of phenomenon of old age as it as it appears to him you've got a little bit of the description of what happens but also his point uh, about character. Uh, but then Socrates then follows that up because there, because notice that is a thesis, right? That wasn't just an unambiguous uh, factual description of something. That was an interpretation. That's Kephlis is saying, here's what I think is salient about the experience and here is, I think it sh here is how I think it should be understood. He might be right. My point is just that those are theses. They're not uh, simple observations of, of facts. Anyway, Socrates says, uh, I was full of wonder at what he said and wanting him to say still more. I stirred him up. And uh, here's what he said. Well, Kephlis, when you say these things, I think that most people don't accept them from you. Now you say, oh, I'm happy because I'm a man of good character. And he says, no, people think you're happy because you're rich. Most, the many do not accept them from you, but they believe rather that it is not due to character that you bear old age so easily, but due to possessing great substance. They say that for the rich, there are many consolations. So we've gone from, well, we've gone from the family house to old age, to a description of that, which brings up the notions of desire, and then one other thing I'm going to mention in a moment, uh, to character, and now to wealth. Right, so we're, get, we're, we're being brought through a series of pretty uh, big and important phenomena and starting to see their connection and their role in a, in a human life. But now let's look at how Kephlas responds to Socrates' challenge. So he says, you know, you're right, this is what people say about me, but they're not right quite for the reason that they say, right? So money does matter, but not in the way they say. And then he gives this interesting remark. He, he says, uh, Th Themistocles said something. Themistocles, famous, very interesting Greek politician, uh, he, he says that uh, once somebody from uh, Seraphos uh, uh, made fun of him, saying, "If you weren't from Athens, you know, you wouldn't be famous." And uh, Themistocles basically says, "Yeah, but if you were from Athens, you wouldn't be famous, right?" So, in other words, Themistocles is saying, "You're right. Being in Athens is." essential to the fact that I've gone on to be an important person. And if I were just from a small town, nobody would have heard of me. But that doesn't mean that being in Athens automatically makes me famous. As he says, you know, you, you came from a small town. Uh, and, uh, but, but that's not why you're not famous, because even if you were in Athens, you wouldn't be famous. Um, the relationships there, I think, are quite important, uh, because they show 
something about the essentiality of context without context being exactly the cause. You know, you could say if, if you plant a seed in concrete, it's not going to grow, right? If you plant a seed in healthy soil, good rich soil, it will grow. Right? But if you plant a dead seed in rich and healthy soil, it's not going to grow, right? So the rich and healthy soil is the essential context and the essential medium that allows growth to happen. But that growth really, the cause of it is the living impulse in the seed. Right? So it's important to distinguish between the, the cause, the real cause, and the surrounding conditions that make it possible for that cause to be realized. Pretty important point. Uh, so that, anyway, that's what he says here. He says, wealth uh, has made it possible for you know me to have fewer pains and problems that I have to deal with. But he's saying it remains the case that the thing that's really the cause of me being content is my character. So it's true, if I had that same character, but I was poor, life would still be pretty miserable. But I could also be rich and be miserable if I didn't have a good character. But so, so then that's his response to the thing about wealth. But then Socrates continues talking about wealth uh, and Kephalus's relationship to it. Uh, so he says, Kephalus, did you inherit or did you earn most of what you possess? And Kephalus goes on to answer that. He inherited some, he earned some, and so on. And Socrates says, the reason I asked you, see, is that to me you don't seem overly fond of money. Uh, I guess that's because he has just, in a certain way, downplayed its significance in that remark. Anyway, Socrates goes on, For the most part, those who do not make money themselves are that way. Uh, those who make it are twice as attached to it as others. Uh, for just as poets are fond of their poems, and fathers are fond of their children, so money makers, too, are serious about money as their own product. And they're also serious about it for the same reason other men are too, for its use. Notice there is more than one reason you could be interested in money. So the thing he has asked in the beginning is this distinction between inheriting and earning. And it, it's very interesting then to, to see this idea that you have a different attachment to something you've earned. I suppose because you see it as in a certain way a reflection of yourself or a reflection of your own effort. Uh, and he says, you know, that's why poets love their poems and so on. Uh, and so Kephalus hasn't really quite demonstrated that attitude towards his money, perhaps. Uh, so, so that's what you know. That's what happens when you earn something. I guess the thing I find interesting is is the thing that's not said. What's your relationship to something that you've inherited? I guess when you have inherited it, you haven't done the work in, required to make it come into being, and consequently, you don't appreciate that about it. You don't really grasp the work that's embodied in the fact of that things being there the fact of you having that thing so yeah when you earn things you know you're really fond of them maybe when you inherit them you're kind of uh, not fond enough of them or maybe fond isn't quite the right word maybe you don't really appreciate quite what you have uh, so I'd like you to think about that issue throughout the reading because I think this point here about inheriting and earning is uh, one of the guiding themes uh, of the remaining work and the, and basically the question is what I suppose what should your relationship be towards your inheritance and also it may be even more basic than that notice the things you've had that you've inherited that you didn't earn and this would be a very worthwhile thing for you to think about on your own the, the Republic is going to draw our attention I think to quite a few of them and uh, really it's going to be drawing our attention to that way. We have inherited these things. So in a sense, we have a debt. Uh, but we take them for granted because we haven't earned them. And consequently, our relationship to our debt is, is not quite right. There's a bit of a mismatch there. I think that's what's going to happen. Anyway, now Socrates and Kephalus go on to their last big exchange uh, where I think the uh, things that are most sort of striking about Kephalus really come out. Um, and so Socrates said, okay, so tell me, what is the greatest good that you have had from possessing wealth? And uh, Kephalus says, well, most people might not think this, uh, but he says, uh, when a man comes near to the realization that he will be making an end, dying, fear and care enter him for things to which he gave no thought before. 
the tales told him about what is in Hades, namely that the one who has done unjust deeds here must pay the penalty there. These tales at which he laughed up till then now make his soul twist and turn because he fears they might be true. So he says then about that person, you know, when you're in that state of fear, he says, uh, he reckons up his accounts and considers whether he has done anything unjust to anyone. Now the man who finds many unjust deeds in his life wakes from his sleep in fright like children do and lives in anticipation of evil. Whereas the man who is conscious in himself of no unjust deed uh, has hope, sweet and good hope are beside him. They're a nurse for his old age. Uh, and then he quotes Pindar. Uh, and I'll just note that he quotes Pindar in a minute. His son, Paul Marx, is going to quote Simonides. A page before, he just was talking about his conversation with the tragic poet Sophocles. The quoting of Pindar and then his son's quoting of Simonides means those guys had traditional aristocratic education where they studied the, these guys, these lyric poets and use them, and you know, Homer and Hesiod, and use them as their textbooks. Le learned about the world through the, the poetic culture of, the, of, the, of Greece, right? Uh, anyway, so he quotes Pindar, and then he says, to bring his point to a conclusion, uh, I count the possession of money most worthwhile, or rothwhile as uh, Bloom translates it, I don't know why, uh, not for any man, but for a decent and orderly one. Right? The, he says, for this, I count the possession most worthwhile. The possession of money contributes a great deal to not cheating or lying to any man against one's will. Notice that doesn't mean he didn't cheat or lie intentionally. But anyway, and he says, uh, and moreover, to not departing for that other place frightened because one owes some sacrifices to a god or money to a human being. Uh, it also has other uses, but this is this is the this is the best one. Uh, this is the one for which wealth is useful to. He says an intelligent man, a man having noose. Noose is another word we're going to come up. Uh, we're going to be dealing with a fair bit. That's that's Kefles's big contribution. So Socrates has said, Socrates has asked him, "What is money most worthwhile for?" And he says, it's most worthwhile for dealing with this issue in human life. And then he said what the issue is. And he says, well, when you're a, well, you know, when a man comes near to knowing he's going to die. So he doesn't say this, he doesn't say this about himself. He's acting as if this is a kind of universal condition. When you get close to death, well, that's when you start thinking about things you never thought about before. Like whether you've been an unjust person. Some of us think of that a little earlier. But anyway, he says people don't really think about that. But then they hear, they think about those stories they used to hear about, you know, heaven and hell. You're going to you're gonna get a good report card or a bad one. You're going to go to heaven or hell, right? So he says, you know, you hear about Hades where you're going to get punished if you were bad. Uh, and then he says, you used to laugh at those tales. But now you think maybe they're right and you get scared. So... Because of that fear, you have to ask yourself, have I been unjust? Am I going to have a good report card? And so he says the thing that money is most valuable for is allowing you to make sure you have a good report card because you can pay back debts, you can pay your bills, and you can pay for enough uh, cows or whatever to sacrifice to the gods so you know you've got you know good account books with other people, good account books with the gods, and therefore you haven't had to lie or cheat to get away with things. So that's, that's what money allows. Uh, uh, well, whether or not that's the best way to think about money, again, is an interesting question in its own right. But that's not the thing that seems to me uh, most striking about this. The thing Socrates is going to pick up on, as we already talked about uh, last time when we were focusing more on Paul and Marcus, Socrates picks up on this account of justice. Like, is this an adequate way to think about justice? But I think this other thing is, in a way, the even more striking thing. Like, look at... Cephalus's relationship to uh, his own moral character and to the stories about the gods. Uh, he says about himself that he's a man of good character, and yet he also basically says, yeah, I never paid attention to the moral issues until I'm near death, right? That's, that's when you think about things you never thought about before, like namely whether you've been doing a good job of being a moral being. That doesn't exactly sound to me like a a great example of fine moral character. So uh, I guess my point there is, 
I'm not sure that the thing Keflis is saying here is particularly universal. It might be common, not universal. Uh, though maybe some, may, there may be something quite important, or in fact, I think there surely is something quite right and important about this idea that facing the reality or the possibility of our own death is a pretty profound existential significance. And probably it does have a pretty profound relationship to this idea that we look at our life as a whole and kind of assess it. Right? So I think the thing he's saying there sounds pretty right. Um, and you might re relate that actually to Socrates in the Phaedo, which is Socrates himself on the day of his death and compare, compare that, or in the Apology again when Socrates is sentenced to death. You could think about how Socrates talks about his relationship to those issues, and I think you'll see that he handles them quite differently than Kephalus. But so, I, as I say, I think I think there's something right about saying that our relationship to our own mortality um, can be an important domain for us having moral reflections on our life as a whole and so on. But I'm not. I, I don't think Kephalus's particular relationship to that is is the only or the best one. Uh, there I'm just talking about, you know, not thinking about things till the last minute. But then he also describes more. He says, uh, that's when you start um, thinking back on these stories you heard. Well, what are the stories? The stories about Hades, right? Well, in other words, he's talking about the traditional religious tales that circulate in a culture, both in a formal form, they're written up in poems like Homer and Pindar and whatever else, but also in the informal way in which People know those stories and just tell them and use them and so on, right? These are the stories uh, that that uh, kind of define a culture in a lot of ways. And and he's saying what his relationship to them is. So, you know, I said religion was going to come up again. Well, that's religion again. He's talking about the stories which kind of define the religion of a culture, in this case, the Greek culture. And how did he relate to them? Well, first of all, he laughed at them. You might have that relationship too. Lots of people do. Lots of people hear uh, the religious stories that are told. Maybe you call them myths. We've got, we've got lots of names for them. Uh, maybe you think, oh, they're like fairy tales. Well, in fact, yeah, maybe they are like fairy tales. Maybe you laugh at fairy tales too. Um, uh, I myself don't think that's a particularly insightful relationship to those stories. I think it probably kind of misses the point. I think uh, um, Kepler's probably missed the point too. But then anyway, he turns around later, and I guess he laughed at them because he thought, oh, those are cartoons that frightened people make up about an imaginary land of heaven and hell and so on. But now when he's old, he thinks, oh, maybe there's a real land of heaven and hell and I'm going to get in trouble. Um, I'm not sure that that's uh, an advance over the laughing attitude. Uh, I don't know that that reflects a very well-developed insight into either reality or the soul or any, you know, human nature or anything else. I mean, I'm inclined to think, on the contrary, that both the laughing about those things and the simplistic interpretation of them as uh, predictions about a magic land where you get a report card and so on, uh, both reflect kind of what he says there about, you know, a child's attitude. Anyway, my point is that's, that's how he relates to those stories he's been told. And we're going to continue to see that issue come up here, and it's important, I think, to remember how they showed up with Kephlis, and for you to see what kind of character that attitude is correlated with. But so anyway, so that, there I think you see an awful lot about Kephlis. Anyway, then you get this point about justice uh, that, that I talked about a little bit before, because in the, in the last lecture when I was talking about Paul Marcus, I talked about Socrates' response to Kephlis' claim here. From, from which Socrates extracts this sort of core idea. Well, it sounds like you're saying justice is telling the truth and paying back debts, and then they analyze it. it turns out to be, you know, interesting, but not not quite deep enough, I suppose. Um, I don't want to pursue that, but I, I want to end this discussion of Kephlis by, by making one more point about his character, and it brings together a few of these things. <laughs> Back at the beginning, when Kephlis said, oh, Socrates, it's great that you're here because now that you know I don't have these desires of the body anymore, what I'm really into is logos, right? Uh, I'm really into speeches or arguments, however you want to construe that word. And as I said, we, we'll talk about logos uh, more. Uh, but so he wants Socrates to have a good conversation with him, or so he says. Right? So here, 
uh, they're having a conversation, it seems. Socrates is asking him questions, very interesting questions, and lots and lots of really big and powerful issues come up here. Aging, the nature of desire, various things about the family. You know, I didn't mention one of the things he brings up. He says, you know, that people get unhappy about their d desires withering, but also they have trouble with their relatives. You know, within the family, uh, relatives aren't very nice to old people and so on. Another very interesting theme that could be discussed. And they don't really talk about that one much more. They just say it. This issue of Themistocles and the Seraphian as an analogy for the relative importance of character versus wealth. That's raised, not pursued that much. Theme of inheritance and earning, huge theme raised. Another theme raised here about the stories of the gods, how you deal with the assessment of your own moral character as you're uh, dying or when you care about that so much stuff comes up here so you know he said he wanted to have a big conversation it seems like they're talking about some pretty exciting stuff and then he says this thing about um you know what why it's most most worthwhile and socrates says you know i don't think that that does that doesn't sound quite right as an account of justice because you put it this way but but what, what, what how would you deal with this this thing right and he's gone as soon as Socrates raises that question, Paul Marcus jumps in to say he's going to answer it. But Cephalus says, yeah, it's great talking with you, Socrates. i got to go off to back to the sacrifices. And he takes off. So, you know, the thing that Socrates is most famous for is this sort of questioning thing. Well, he did that already when he says, uh, I stirred him up by asking about wealth. Uh, so there he challenged him a bit. Um, then he talked about... Uh, uh, more with him about money, but didn't really challenge him again. But now he challenges him a little bit on justice, and uh, Cephalus just doesn't want to carry on with it. So uh, I wonder then, or you know, I I look at that as a as a reflection on Cephalus's claim that now that the pleasures of the body have, have withered, he really is committed to the pleasures of speech or logos. I look at that and I think mm, he doesn't seem very interested in that. He may like to entertain himself by being the guy who's asked to say wise things or something like that, but it doesn't seem like he wants to investigate things, certainly not the way Socrates does. Certainly not the way Socrates does when he's 70 years old and about to die, right, in the Phaedo or in the Apology. With Socrates' old age, the extreme commitment to the need to work through these arguments uh, remains just as pronounced as it was in, in his the, the youngest stories of him that are reported. Whereas Cephalus doesn't seem to have much uh, energy for that, much interest in that. So again, you know, going back to inheriting and earning, you know, uh, Socrates says, well, poets are really fond of their poems. Uh, fathers are very fond of their sons. People who earn money are really fond of their money. Uh, here, Cephalus has put forward an opinion that comes up against a certain kind of challenge, and he doesn't care to pursue that. It makes it seem there like that the, again, he hasn't really earned those things in the sense that he's not really invested in uh, thinking. I don't think he's really invested in argument. He may be invested in people viewing him as wise. He may be invested in the opinions he has. But in the intellectual work you have to do to produce and justify a, an opinion, to earn an opinion... It doesn't seem to me to be particularly interested in that, particularly fond of that. So so I think in this conversation with Keflis, many, many amazing and interesting points are brought out. The theme of aging, the difference between character and aging, uh, the difference, difference between character and aging as a biological phenomenon, the difference between cause and condition in the example of Themistocles, uh, uh, the importance of wealth, the distinction between inheriting and earning. How should you construe uh, the desires that um, for many people seem to diminish in old age, the desire for sex, uh, intoxication, and partying? Uh, are they, I mean, they, they probably are related to the body. Like you use your part, your body in dancing, you use your body in drinking, you use your body in sex. So I think Keflis is probably right to say they're associated with the body, but how? Um, and uh, and indeed the the theme of a uh, uh, interest in logos these themes come come up they're they're really rich and exciting things really powerful ones really philosophically important ones so I get that out of this conversation with Cephalus and then actually in the background the 
larger philosophical theme of the nature of the family, but I guess that's not really what they're talking about. But in terms of the things they're talking about, really big stuff comes out here. But in that context, I think we see something about Kephlis's character. Right? He's a bit like the Seraphian. He's got the richest soil you could imagine. And you plant his seed and nothing comes out of it, I think. I think that as a thinker, or as a philosopher, as a wise person, Kephlis has virtually nothing to offer in that way. He's a seed that doesn't go anywhere, even though he's given the richest material. You to compare that with how Socrates relates to these things. It's a very different story. So, you know, I was, I was wanting to compare the different characters in Book One of the Republic. The last time we looked at um, Paul Marcus, this time we're looking at Kephlis, and I think you can see a, a very big difference there between how Kephlis responds to Socrates' challenges and where he goes with that, and how Paul Marcus responds, right? Kephlis wants to sit back and be wise, and he's not going to argue, and he takes off. Paul Marcus is just so eager. And his dad says something, and Socrates goes back, and Paul Marcus jumps in because he wants to get in there. He's got opinions. And they, and they don't talk about all kinds of other stuff. They just focus on that issue for, you know, five or six pages, and they hammer away at analyzing it. And Paul Marcus is right in there, comes up against some challenges, and uh, ultimately, it seems, has his... Uh, view changed in a pretty important way. So very different kinds of interlocutors. So I want to leave the Kephlis portrait there. And next time, we'll look at the final uh, big character of Book One of the Republic, Thrasymachus. Mm -hmm.